Many of you were able to attend the launch, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed it as much as we did, although I'm sure that the view was not quite as unique. Uh, here's a picture of the big bird sitting on the pad with the uh, vertical assembly building in the background. Uh, we had banker's hours on this flight. We were able to get up uh, around uh, 5 or 6 in the morning, get uh, suited up, make sure our uh, suits worked okay, and uh, walk out. We took one big one look at the uh, big bird just before he walked into it, got on the uh, swing arm and walked across and got strapped in. Helped the ground crew check out the spacecraft, and uh, promptly at 11, she lifted off. <clears throat> when, the, when the main engines ignited, there was a certain amount of shaking and rattling that was obvious. I was wondering if the solids had ignited. Uh, but when they, when they uh, touch off, there's no doubt. There's uh, a tremendous uh, feeling of commotion and power down there behind you and a relentless push that is, just adds up to the, the ride of a lifetime. Uh, there's nothing that will ever even remotely approach the feeling of uh, first stage on the solids. From uh, my right-hand window, uh, lying on, on the back, this is the view if you turned your head 90 degrees to the right and watched, had a camera pointed out that way. You can see the roll maneuver, then we went into the very thin overcast and quickly popped out the top. Like Gordo said, it was the uh, ride of a lifetime, uh, lots of vibration, lots of dynamics, and uh, uh, just a relentless push for eight and a half minutes into orbit. Uh, it just was a continuous, uh, continuous, uh, endless acceleration and push all the way up there. We were able to perform our functions and talk and do our job, but we knew we had a tiger by the tail. The first stage, uh, of course, burned for about two, minute, two, two minutes and six seconds. Uh, I understand you had a good view of it as it came out to the top of this cloud, a very spectacular shot. We were uh, uh, VFR on top, as the pilots say, uh, very quickly uh, with uh, very little actual instrument time. The roll maneuver was uh, performed precisely and uh, uh, we uh, got the separation of the sol solid rocket motors at two minutes and six seconds. And uh, we didn't feel it or hear it, but we did see that flash of flame around the cockpit as the uh, solid rockets were jettisoned and uh, parachuted into the ocean where they were picked up uh, uh, so that they can be refurbished and used again. This is a close-up picture of the uh, solid rocket motor breaking away from the uh, external tank. It's interesting that as soon as the solids uh, burn out and are jettisoned, uh, everything smooths out absolutely as smooth as glass. Uh, it's, it's the nicest ride, uh, smoother than any airliner any of you have ever flown on. Uh, we uh, got the main engine cut off at 8 minutes and 34 seconds. Uh, we waited for the external tank to be jettisoned. This is an underneath picture of the tank being jettisoned and uh, falling away from the spacecraft. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, we ignited the uh, maneuvering engines to uh, put us into orbit. Uh, we made two firings of the uh, orbital maneuvering system. Uh, so after about it, uh, 45 minutes, we were in orbit and able to open the payload bay doors. If you look quickly, uh, that's Los Angeles, the uh, South Bay, Palos Verdes Peninsula, then on down to San Diego. Then a few seconds later, that's the Salton Sea and the Imperial Valley in California, which greeted us as we uh, opened that first payload bay door. The uh, sight was ex as spectacular for us as it was uh, for you, and as you see it in these pictures here, it was uh, truly a... Uh, a momentous event for us and uh, most impressive, uh, the pictures uh, and the memories don't do it justice. You just have to go back and do it again in order to <laughs> appreciate it fully. The, the uh, morning of the first day was when we first uh, got the, uh, the remotely controlled arm uh, made by the Canadians into business. Second day actually, uh, Jack, if you remember. <laughs> uh, and Jack had discovered some tile missing out in front of the windshield. If you notice those uh, square, irregular uh, patches uh, in front of the windshield, those are actual missing white tile. So we moved the arm up uh, and got it over to the uh, right-hand side and looked along uh, on a kind of a grazing angle here, but had a view and found some more tile missing. Uh, however, those were, the, those were relatively insignificant. As it turned out, on entry, I've heard the number that the highest temperature noted on the top in the area of the missing tile was only 140 degrees or so. Actually, the tile didn't slow us down much. Uh, we knew that uh, lots of people would be concerned about it, and uh, so we uh, erased it from our thought and uh, went on to do the other business. Uh, we did have some venting from uh, one of the main engines uh, that uh, was with us for about uh, two to three days, which we reported. And, uh, 
it was determined what the venting was. Uh, this is the way it looked, however, when the sunlight shone on it uh, with a dark background. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, after about two or three days, it went away. Now an inside shot. I'm at the uh, manipulator operator station, and Jack has taken this movie right here as I uh, brought the plasma diagnostics package out of the payload bay for the first time. We put the uh, manipulator arm through uh, the loaded operations, that is, with an attached payload for the first time in its uh, ever, uh, and exercised all the very complex sequences that the manipulator arm has built into it. Uh, some of those involve manually positioning the arm, others uh, with the software doing it automatically, and the, uh, our job merely to monitor, uh, to monitor uh, iterations. Uh, we operated the arm night and day, so when the sun went down, we turned on lights in the payload bay and found that they were uh, adequate to see it visually as well as operate our television system. Periodically, it would uh, show up in the overhead window as you see it pictured here, and uh, then it would be moved to the forward uh, uh, part of the spacecraft up over the nose to uh, make some measurements. And uh, it was spectacular to just to watch it uh, come real close and, uh, and uh, silently, uh, but smoothly move to its next point in the sequence. Uh, and uh, this gives you the full appreciation of the total spectacle of the background. Uh, this is a picture that was taken uh, as we were going over the Baja Peninsula in an uh, ascending pass over the United States. Well, you can really can see we didn't do much work up there and finally came time to come home. So we uh, got the payload bay doors closed and, uh, and I got a wave off for mission control. But uh, finally the next day they decided they'd bring us in anyway. And uh, here are a few shots that uh, many of you were able to witness from the ground personally of the uh, orbiter making its approach and landing at uh, Holloman Air Force at uh, White Sands uh, Northrop Strip there. Near Holloman Air Force Base, who provided lots of support for the whole operation there. The uh, entry was as spectacular as the uh, boost was uh, in terms of dynamics and, uh, and sensation and uh, excitement and high adventure. It uh, was a machine that slowed down from 25 times the speed of sound to zero in about uh, 25 to 30 minutes and uh, it had it it felt like it just had the brakes on all the way and uh, all the way and uh, the uh, most spectacular quick tours at low altitude and high speed of the United States anybody will ever have the uh, airplane was flown uh, manually uh, from uh, about 40,000 feet down to about 10,000 feet here's a picture out Gordo's window of what uh, he saw from inside we're just uh, roll into the right bank, turning uh, the 90 degree turn from our approach heading onto final approach. And as you uh, see the white sands come into view and look closely, the uh, runway uh, will become visible, but then uh, go out of sight again. There's a, the approach to the runway right there. But uh, because of the uh, strong westerly wind, we had to crab to the right. Right now, Jack is engaging the audio system, and you can see it making a, a quick correction to the right, then back to the left. But with that uh, correction for the wind drift, it's hiding the view of the runway until we get down here a little closer, and you'll be able to see our aim point come into view. You'll see a triangle and a rectangle. We are actually aiming for the rectangle, and there's some lights in there, not readily visible till just about now, that helped us uh, determine that the guidance system had us exactly on the uh, proper glide slope. Okay, uh, we got it firmly established on the uh, inner glide slope, and um, and uh, then took over manually and uh, made the landing, and the. Uh, and the rollout. We used the whole runway, although we didn't have to. It would have been possible to have uh, stopped much sooner had it been uh, necessary. And uh, here is a final shot of the uh, uh, final part of the approach. Uh, Gordo got the wheels down at 275 knots, uh, right on the money. And um, we uh, broke the rate of descent right in here and uh, then landed and uh, made the rollout. I noticed that the uh, wheels, nose wheel was going down a little uh, more quickly than I wanted it to and uh, had to hold it off some. In doing so, I uh, over-rotated a little bit and kind of popped a wheelie there, but uh, no harm done. And the, uh, the uh, Columbia made a good smooth rollout. Uh, at the end of it, we made a little nose wheel steering test and uh, stopped it uh, before the end of the, the uh, uh, drawn-out runway.